In 1936, a famous literary character said, Men have been hung on less evidence than there is for the existence of the Loch Ness Monsters. My name is Frank Searle. Back in the 1960s, I became interested in the Loch Ness scene and looked very closely at all this evidence. And it was very mystifying, to say the least. For on one side of the story, there were hundreds of years of written records, and on the other side, the British media making a big joke of it. Well, was it a joke? Or was it what hundreds of years of history indicated? There was only one way to find out. On June the 16th, 1969, I pitched a tent on the banks of Loch Ness, and for the next six years, winter and summer, I spent all hours of daylight out in a small boat with cameras. I talked with gamekeepers, water bailiffs, salmon fishermen and forestry workers, and soon acquired a vast knowledge of the local environment. And then I realised that 60% of what had been written and talked about Loch Ness was sheer fiction. But the remaining 40% was, and still is, a very fascinating story. So what is this story of Loch Ness? More than 250 million years ago, and that's a geologist's figure, a movement of the Earth's crust on a fault line formed the great rift across Scotland, which is now known as the Great Glen. Water running down from the hills gradually filled the deeper parts of this rift, and today it consists of the three main lochs, Ness, Oik and Lochie, which, since the middle of the 19th century, have been linked up by the man-built Caledonian Canal. This waterway, more than 60 miles long, provides a passage for smaller craft from the North Sea to the Atlantic Ocean, thus avoiding the very dangerous sea route round the north of Scotland. Loch Ness is by far the largest of the three lochs, being nearly 24 miles in length, just under one mile wide, and with an area of 21.78 square miles. It is not the largest lake in Great Britain, but it contains much more water than any other British lake. In fact, it has been estimated that it contains something like 265,000 million cubic feet of water. The deepest part of the loch is opposite the John Cobb Memorial, at 980 feet, and the mean depth of 433 feet is considerably greater than the mean depth of the North Sea. Some 40 yards from the beach on either side, the bed drops away, giving a series of underwater rock faces, ledges and huge overhangs. Loch Ness is fed by eight rivers, 60 major streams and hundreds of small streams, all running down from the surrounding hills. It is free from pollution, but the rivers and streams wash down millions of tiny peat particles, which make visibility in the water almost non-existent. Engine Corporation, 14 and a half hours. Amongst the 40,000 pounds worth of equipment which they brought along was a new type of infrared underwater camera just developed by the... As part of the film, we did extensive underwater tests and the maximum penetration of the peaty water by their fabulous camera was a mere five yards at a depth of 30 feet. To back up their claim that this was the best camera of its kind in the world, NTV carried out night tests from a field at Boleskine on what must have surely been the worst night of the year. Mist all over the loch, pitch dark, drizzling with rain. With producer Mr Junichi Yao, I sat watching the video screen as the camera swept the opposite bank more than one mile away. And we could see that stretch of countryside as plainly as we would have seen it in bright sunlight. It was a revelation to see this camera working. It even picked out the litter bins on a faraway lay-by. Yet penetrated search with many sub water many hundreds of strain in the surface of this huge dark stretch of water. 
The first written records were made some 1,400 years ago. Ninth Bishop of Iona, writing a biography of St. Columba, makes reference to water monsters being seen by people living around Loch Ness. Much has been written about the Loch Ness monsters. A little fact, some supposition, and very much sheer rubbish. Even now, as we rapidly approach the end of the 20th century, in an age which has seen men land on the moon, all we really know about Loch Ness is that its murky waters contain some living creatures which are far larger than anything that would be expected in a Scottish freshwater lake. Normally the largest thing in a landlocked stretch of water like this would be a 60 pound salmon, which is less than five feet long, or a pike, or an otter of the same size. But in Loch Ness, thousands of people have seen a creature break the surface, which is certainly 30 feet, maybe more in length. An animal of that size is not the largest thing on this planet, but it is huge when compared to a five feet salmon or an otter. All that can really be added to this is the fact that a very high percentage of eyewitness reports over a very long period of time all give much the same description something with a small head, long tapering neck, a huge bulky body and a long tail. There is much evidence to suggest that the creatures have four large flippers or paddles. How then did these strange beasts get into Loch Ness? Although we have established that the Great Glen was formed millions of years ago, geologists believe that the loch was open to the North Sea as recently as seven and a half thousand years ago and that, set against prehistoric times, is a very short time indeed. So I think it must be accepted that these animals were coming to and from the North Sea, using the loch as a feeding or breeding ground, as many large sea creatures use the Scandinavian fields. There was a local land upheaval in the area where the town of Inverness now stands, and some of the creatures were trapped. Some marine biologists have given about 14 as being the minimum number that would be required to maintain the species over a period of time. They are, of course, working on the assumption that the Loch Ness animals behave the same as species they have been able to study. They could be right, or totally wrong. But we have to accept someone's figures before we can start any kind of discussion. Of course, we wouldn't be left with the bear 14. On the other hand, there cannot be too many, or they would surely be seen more often. Perhaps it might be safe to think of somewhere around 30. Some writers have used the expression, a breeding herd. I think it much more likely that the creatures in Loch Ness would be split into three or four small families, each keeping more or less to its own part of the loch, except during their breeding season. There have been quite a few fairly reliable reports of two animals being seen together and one report of three, which the witness thought to be two large ones and a small one. But to my knowledge there has never been a reported huge disturbance which might indicate a herd or shoal of the creatures. There is no doubt that the Loch Ness animals closely resemble a prehistoric creature called a plesiosaur. These aquatic beasts were known to have lived in the Northern Hemisphere and several skeletons have been found in the British Isles. There is one on display at the Natural History Museum in London and the latest one was discovered in a chalk pit near Peterborough in England in September 1973. So there could be a possibility that the Loch Ness monsters are descended from or closely related to the prehistoric plesiosaur. Over the years there have been many reports of strange sightings in the North Sea and the North Atlantic. Most of these have been made by seamen. But since the end of World War II there have been several made by scientists working with the fishing industry. And in more than a few of these reports we hear of a small head, long neck, large body. There have also been similar reports from lakes in Canada, Finland and Russia. A quick glance at a map of the world will show that Canada, 
the North Atlantic, Scotland, the North Sea, Finland and Russia are pretty much in line. And remembering that only a little over 7,000 years ago, Loch Ness was open to the sea, there seems to be a definite tie-up. Loch Ness sightings have only become more widely publicised because, since good roads were built in the early 30s, there has been easy access to the area. The other lakes and seas from which reports come from time to time are in more remote places. Reading through some of the books that have been written about the Loch Ness Monsters, one gets the definite impression that quite a lot of research has been carried out. Unfortunately, this is totally untrue. And in making that statement, I am, of course, referring to serious, dedicated research. Much of the so-called investigation was done for publicity or sheer financial gain. For 11 years, the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau practically ruled the Loch Ness scene. Founded by, among others, naturalist Sir Peter Scott and Conservative Member of Parliament Mr David James, the Bureau has been written up by some authors, particularly Mr Tim Dinsdale and Nicholas Witchell, as being a big investigation centre. But, as the old saying goes, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The Bureau received sponsorship from many sources, especially from the USA, charged admission fees, and sold books, picture postcards and Loch Ness key rings to thousands of tourists. Despite these almost unlimited funds, any investigation was very amateurish indeed, and over the last couple of years, the camera watching was almost non-existent. The Bureau failed to come up with a decent picture or any other worthwhile evidence. Se several universities have carried out short-term expeditions, but most of them work with the Bureau, and very little came out to the British public. The famous Japanese Loch Ness expedition of 1973 was a complete farce. Its members brought less equipment than the average tourist carries. In fact, its leader was a Chinese boxing promoter who puts on pop shows and other spectaculars in Tokyo for cash. Later came the so-called Boston Academy of Applied Sciences, headed by a Mr. Robert Rhines. This man's activities have been written up as scientific investigation by the media. Newspaper reports refer to him as an American scientist. In actual fact, he is merely a patent lawyer. In 1975, he, cl he claimed to have taken hazy underwater pictures of a Nessie. But it now seems pretty certain that what he produced were pictures of a plastic film monster lost in Urquhart Bay during the making of a comedy film in 1969. Mr. Rhines anchored his raft very close to the spot where the plastic monster sank, and I have recently been able to acquire pictures of this model. The resemblance is so striking that coincidence must be ruled out. It seems, therefore, that most of the dedicated watching of Loch Ness is done by the loners, the enthusiastic men and women, boys and girls, who year after year pitch their tents or park their caravans by the lockside and spend all hours of daylight gazing at the dark water through binoculars and telephoto lens and fervently hoping that one of the beasts will come within range. Unfortunately, most people's holidays are of short duration, and as the sightings are few and far between, and in many cases merely a brief breaking of the surface, only a small minority of the watchers get any reward for their dedication. I wouldn't think that there are more than about ten or a dozen genuine sightings a year over the whole loch. And there is no pattern whatsoever. There is no evidence to suggest that one part of the loch is best for sightings. The creatures have been seen in all kinds of weather conditions, at any time of the day, and in all months of the year. There would be no climatic seasons for the creatures, because the water in Loch Ness has a constant temperature of 6 degrees centigrade, that's 43 Fahrenheit. The fact that the sightings are so infrequent surely suggests that the beasts do not have to come up for air. If they did, people like myself and my fishermen friends would see them more often. Why then do we see them at all? I think the answer is a very simple one, 
Like the plesiosaur, these beasts have to be fish eaters. There is not enough vegetation in the loch to support any large life. The monsters could feed on eels. There are millions of them in Loch Ness, some quite large, and they do go down into the depths. But a large part of the fish population is made up of salmon, sea trout and brown trout. The former run up the River Ness from the North Sea, through the loch and spawn in the rivers and streams which feed it. And these fish are all very close to the surface. When I troll for salmon, my lures are only a few feet down. A creature some 30 feet in length with a long neck and a large body coming to within a few feet of the surface to catch its food must surely show part of itself. And there have been many reports of unusual fish activity just before a sighting. Attempts to lure the creatures with fish baits, hormones, underwater sounds of aquatic beasts etc. have been tried but without success. The problem is that the animals have to be above the surface before they can be photographed. It might be interesting to note here that although many leading scientists refuse to accept their existence, the monsters have been protected by a local bylaw since 1934. The attitude of science towards anything unusual is pathetic. I myself came up against this in 1974. In January of that year I obtained two very good pictures of a Nessie from a lay-by two miles west of Dawes village. A newspaper reporter took the negatives and blow-ups of these pictures to Glasgow University's Department of Zoology. And for a while the chief lecturer in zoology was most enthusiastic. He told the reporter that these were by far the best pictures he'd seen from Loch Ness and said, I think this must be an extinct reptile of the plesiosaur family. Great stuff indeed. But then he realised that he was sticking his neck out and had to go back and face his colleagues. He stopped infusing and insisted on the reporter closing his article with these words. But of course science would find it hard to accept pictures. We would really want one of the animals on the table. So here we have the situation where an eminent scientist at a famous university privately goes along with the plesiosaur theory, but in his official capacity he just does not want to know. It seems that with scientists any urge for discovery is far outweighed by love of their reputations. There have been stories over the years of the monsters being seen on land. But after many thousands of hours of investigation, I am not too happy about this side of the Loch Ness story. Most authors merely tell their readers that someone saw a large animal on the road or the beach. They never ask if the thing was possible. So let us look at both aspects. On the one hand, a few stories, but no pictures. And most of the stories second hand. Now we know the shape of the Loch Ness animals. I wonder, is it possible for that huge body on its big flippers to crawl up the steep banks around the loch and walk across the road? And why should they want to do that? The creatures are not air breathing. That's against land sightings. There has never been a picture taken of a Loch Ness monster on land. Very strange. If these creatures could indeed wander across the road, surely they would be so slow and cumbersome that by now half the local population would have obtained photographs. There have been no reports of animals having been taken from lockside farms. Nor have there been reports of trees and bushes on the banks being stripped of vegetation. And most significant fact, there have never been any tracks or marks found on the banks or the beaches by the professional gamekeepers, water bailiffs and salmon fishermen. So to sum up, there is much, much more against land sightings than for them. I am often asked why no remains are ever found washed up on the beaches. Well, there is a legend that Loch Ness never gives up its dead. People drown and the bodies are never recovered. 
Even dead fish do not float on Loch Ness. It has been established that the mineral content, the density and the constant temperature combined to delay the chemical action which in other waters brings bodies to the surface after a certain time. The bed of Loch Ness is one big peat bog. What the eels did not eat would quickly sink into this sludge. And the water is far too deep for a sophisticated dredging operation to be carried out. It would not be possible to get a large ocean-going dredger through the narrow Caledonian Canal. Speaking to thousands of visitors each year, I find that people who profess to be sceptical about the existence of the Loch Ness Monsters are only that way because they know very little about the scene. And this is mainly due to the very bad reporting by the British media. There has never been a decent Loch Ness documentary on British television, nor has there been a good factual report in any of our newspapers or magazines. It may well be that this tongue-in-cheek attitude by the media deters scientists from making any serious attempts to identify the Loch Ness animals. I think that anyone really interested in the phenomena must come to Loch Ness, get the atmosphere, realise the size of the loch and talk with people living round it. Many people visiting my information centre for the first time have said, now that we have seen the place and obtained some intelligent answers to our questions, we really believe that the animals are there. I am often asked what I would do if someone came up with the money for a full-scale investigation. Well, we have established that no bodies ever come up to the surface of Loch Ness. So, in the peat sludge at the bottom must be the skeletons of everything that ever died in the loch. Scientists say that they are not satisfied with pictures, that they want something on the table. So let's give them a skeleton, a skull, or perhaps a few bones would do. Although I have said that a sophisticated dredging operation would be very difficult, just a few miles away from Loch Ness, we have a technology taking oil and natural gas from under the North Sea in pretty bad conditions. I think, given the money, the underwater experts with the North Sea oil companies would soon find a way of getting a skeleton up from the bed of the loch. Our problem at the moment is in getting some organisation to put up the money. It seems that no one will consider putting any serious money into Loch Ness investigation unless they are guaranteed a big profit on their outlay within a certain time. And of course we cannot make such guarantees. Many young people visiting my site during the holidays ask if Nessie is anything like a sea serpent. They probably get this idea from the picture postcards which show the Loch Ness Monster as a huge serpent-like creature with anything from 12 to 20 humps and sometimes wearing a tartan cap. But seriously, there can well be a connection between the Loch Ness animals and the legendary sea serpent. We have already established that the loch was open to the sea quite recently, so it's easy to accept that there were more Nesses swimming about in the North Sea and the North Atlantic. And there have been similar sightings made in sea lochs and fields. Over hundreds of years there have been reports of sea serpents being seen all over the world, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. The Scandinavian countries with their strong maritime traditions have a long history of such sightings. In the early 19th century, hundreds of people claimed to have seen a sea serpent off the east coast of the United States of America, in the area of Massachusetts Bay. In October 1848, a frigate came into Portsmouth Harbour 
with stories of seeing an enormous sea monster nearly 100 feet in length. While sailing between the Cape of Good Hope and St. Helena, the captain and many of the crew watched the creature for nearly 20 minutes. It was described as a huge serpent with head and neck about four feet above the surface. It was dark brown on top and yellowish white underneath. It travelled at about ten knots. And then on December the 7th, 1905, two English naturalists saw an object some 100 yards from the research vet ship Valhalla. They described a head and neck and some distance behind a frill or a ruff. The head was about seven feet above the water. It was dark brown on top and almost white on the underside. There have been several stories of the carcasses of unknown sea beasts being washed up. In 1808, for instance, the body of a large animal was washed up on one of the Orkney Islands, known then as Stronza. The Stronza beast, as it came to be known, was almost 55 feet in length. It had a small flat head mounted on a long tapering neck. A crest or ruff ran along the back of the body and down the tail. The body was small compared with the neck and tail, and the strangest thing of all was three pairs of legs or flippers. It was badly decomposed and mutilated, but the Stronza beast has long puzzled zoologists. In his book In the Wake of the Sea Serpent, Professor Bernard Hovelmans analyzes hundreds of sightings reports of large water beasts dating from the mid-1600s to the present time. After eliminating some reports as being mistakes or hoaxes, he concludes that there may well be as many as nine different types of large unknown sea creatures. And I, for one, would not care to argue with Professor Hoverman's estimate. Some day, and let us hope it will be in the not-too-distant future, some lucky person, if not myself, will get really close-up, detailed pictures showing eyes, teeth and skin texture. Perhaps then the British media will treat the Loch Ness story seriously, and the British Museum will be induced to launch a full-scale scientific investigation. Until then, we enthusiasts will keep on the job, each hoping to be the one to obtain the final conclusive evidence.
And now to take a look at some of the more interesting sightings that have occurred over the years. Perhaps 1933 would be a good year in which to start. On September the 22nd, 1933, at about 11 a.m. on a beautiful sunny day, four ladies were watching the loch at a point between Urquhart Bay and Invermorriston. And Miss Fraser said she saw something which looked like a mythical creature. She described a head about the size of a small dog's, a long neck, a humped body, and what seemed to be a tail. The neck sank till only the head showed, then rose again. A Miss Howden gave the same description, and said that the colour was dark grey. A third member of the group, Mrs Fraser, saw the tail, which she said splashed about for a few seconds. They all agreed that the head turned from side to side. In October 1933, a Miss Fiona MacDonald was walking by the loch near Fort Augustus and saw a Nessie at a distance of about half a mile. It showed a hump which she thought was dark grey to black. A V-shaped ripple spread out from the front while behind was a big wake of white foam. On either side was a continuous violent splashing, which might have been caused by flippers or paddles. The first known photograph was taken in November 1933 by Mr. Hugh Gray of Foyers. He was on the beach near where the Foyers River enters the loch. A large black object rose out of the water to a height of about three feet. Mr. Gray was carrying a small camera, and managed to take just one picture before the animal submerged. The negative was examined at the offices of the Daily Record and by a representative of Kodak. They certified that there was no sign of tampering with the negative and that the published print had not been retouched. In December of 1933, a Mr. Jameson was driving his van along the lockside and spotted one of the creatures less than a hundred yards offshore. He described it as head, long neck and humped back. The colour was greyish black, and he thought the skin was rough and knobbly. He estimated the hump as being about three feet above the water, and the overall length about twenty feet. A disturbance of water behind the hump seemed to indicate a tail. The sighting lasted perhaps ten seconds. In May 1934, a Miss Anne MacDonald saw an animal rising from the water less than fifty yards away near doors. It appeared as a dark hump. Then a second hump appeared. A third smaller hump showed at one end and proved to be the head and neck, which rose vertically from the water, then seemed to undulate up and down. The head was quite small. After a very short time it sank and did not reappear. Then came the much publicised surgeon's picture of 1934. Dr. R.K. Wilson was standing by the loch when he noticed a disturbance on the water some 300 yards away. Then a small head and long neck were seen rising out of the water. Dr. Wilson took two pictures. The first has been reproduced time and again, but it was not until 1957 that the second one was published. This shows the neck at a different angle to the water, indicating that the thing was moving. Unfortunately, these pictures show no background to prove where they were taken. A very good view of a monster was had by the captain, the mate and five crewmen of the steam tug Arrow in August 1938. Captain Brodie of Leith said that the vessel was about two miles east of Urquhart Castle. This would be somewhere opposite where the Clansman Hotel now stands. He and the mate saw a large humpbacked animal rise to the surface and keep pace with the ship at some distance. The five crewmen were called on deck just in time to see the creature submerge. But almost at once it reappeared and tore past the tug at great speed. The lock was calm, but the creature set up quite large waves. Captain Brody estimated the length at about 30 feet and the colour black. 
In July 1952, Mrs. Greta Finlay of Inverness was in a caravan near Tor Point, accompanied by her young son. They heard a splashing in the water and dashed out onto the beach. Mrs. Finlay said that just 20 yards away, they saw a long neck and a small, very ugly head. She later described it as the most repulsive thing she'd ever seen. For some seconds she gazed at the thing in amazement, then recovered and dashed to the caravan for a camera. But even before she reached it, the creature had disappeared. In December 1954, a small fishing trawler passing through the loch kept his echo sounder going. It recorded a large object swimming freely some 120 feet from the loch bottom at a point where it is known to be 600 feet deep. The makers of the sounding equipment certified that the chart was genuine. In the summer of 1962, Mr. Jimmy Cameron of Inverness and Mr. Dan McIntosh of Dawes were fly fishing from a drifting boat near Tor Point, opposite the village of Dawes. Suddenly the boat rocked violently, although the loch was fairly calm. Then Mr. Cameron saw something break the surface less than 30 yards away. For a moment he thought it was a very large salmon. Then, to the utter amazement of both men, a long neck surmounted by a small flat head rose from the water. It submerged immediately, came up again some 20 yards further away, submerged again, and then the watchers saw a V-shaped wake move rapidly away up the loch. My own best sighting was probably the one in July 1974. Accompanied by student teacher Linda Tate from Yorkshire, who was staying with me, I took my boat out at first light, about 4 a.m. The sky was cloudy and the light not too good, but the water was fairly calm. At about 5.25 a.m. we were heading towards Dawes Bay, running about 30 yards from the beach. Suddenly a long neck and a small head shot up some 500 yards away. I got one quick shot using a 135mm lens with a 2 times converter. Unfortunately, it's not often possible to use a really long lens from a moving boat. The thing was in sight for perhaps five seconds. My companion had to turn to see what I was photographing, and just about saw something. The picture shows the head and neck quite clearly, with a violent water disturbance behind the neck. And most important, very clear background. This, of course, is essential. The two sightings on May the 4th, 1976, were very interesting. In the early afternoon, Mr. and Mrs. John Ely of New Haven, Connecticut, USA, visited my site. They then drove round the loch, and at about 5.30 p.m. were parked on a lay-by between Urquhart Bay and the Klansman Hotel. Next morning they returned to my site to tell me what they'd seen. Mrs. Ely described an upturned boat shape, dark grey in colour, some ten feet or more in length and three feet above the surface, which appeared for about ten seconds at a distance of about four hundred yards. Later that day, I heard that Mr. Tom Skinner of Telford Road, Inverness, had been cycling along the lockside at about 7 p.m. and had had a similar sighting. But this time the beast had broken the surface twice. Mr. Skinner was at a point about one mile east of where the Americans were parked. Two sightings within two hours and only a mile apart could suggest that both witnesses had seen the same animal, which may have been near the surface feeding in that area. Well, these are but a few of thousands of eyewitness reports made over a long period of time. The evidence is truly overwhelming, isn't it? And now perhaps we should take a look at some of the points of interest around the loch. A must for thousands of visitors to Inverness Shire is the drive around Loch Ness. 
This was made easy by the construction of the A82 road in the 1930s and the improving of General Wade's military road along the south bank some years later. Many visitors only realised the vastness of Loch Ness after making this journey. The motorist who records his mileage will find that he clocks up more than 70 miles. But even with today's high running costs, the trip is well worthwhile. Leaving Inverness, one takes the Dawes Road, which for a short distance runs beside the River Ness and the picturesque Ness Islands. Some four miles on and the road is flanked by stately copper beech trees. Along this stretch is the Scanniport Caravan site. Although there is no access to the Loch or River, it is a useful overnight stop for campers. The toilet facilities are good and there is hot and cold water. The traveller gets his first glimpse of Loch Ness from the Bray above Alderi School. And halfway down the Bray, looking to the north, one sees Alderi Castle, stately home of Lieutenant Colonel A.E. Cameron. Another mile or so and we reach the village of Dawes and the start of Loch Ness. The Dawes Inn, small but friendly, has a well-stocked bar and a restaurant which is open all day during the summer months. From here it is possible to walk along the beach to Tor Point. Several very good Nessie sightings have been made in Dawes Bay. One mile west of Dawes is Balacladdock Farm, which advertises a camping film. This could be an ideal spot for Nessie watchers and anglers, with its easy access to more than half a mile of beach. For the next six miles or so, the road runs parallel and very close to the water's edge. This is one of the most popular stretches. There are six large laybys, and at each one the Forestry Commission have cut away the trees so that visitors have a good view of the loch. And on three of these viewpoints there are tables and seats for the benefit of picnickers. There is fairly easy access to the beach from all six laybys. From February the gorse provides a blaze of gold along the roadside and spring visitors enjoy the thousands of primroses which grow on the sloping banks. These viewpoints along the south bank are ideal for Nessie watchers as they are not too high and it is therefore quite easy to get background in any pictures taken. Next point of interest is the forestry village of Inverfarragay. Just past the village a road to the left leads to a forestry walk. Here trees are labelled for identification, several are sawn through so that the age can be calculated, and near the top of the walk is a badger set. A mile or so past Inverfarragay, one passes, on the left, Beleskid House. This property was once owned by the so-called black magician Alastair Crowley, and it was from here that he was supposed to have performed the dangerous Arbra Meeling ceremony of evoking spirits. Beleskin House is now owned by guitarist Jimmy Page of the Led Zeppelin group, but he does not live there and the house is not open to the public. Opposite the house is the picturesque Beleskin graveyard, burial ground of the Fraser clan. This is open to visitors. On through to foyers. The Foyers Hotel provides refreshments, meals and accommodation. And one gets a marvellous view of the lock from its car park. There is also a petrol pump at the hotel. A hundred yards further and a road to the right leads down to Lower Foyers. From 1895 until a few years ago, the British Aluminium Company had a factory on the lock side. This was the first industry in the British Isles to use hydroelectric power. Part of the Foyers River was diverted to run beneath the factory and drive the turbines. Mr Hugh Gray, who took the first known picture of a Nessie on November the 22nd, 1933, was an employee at the factory. Just past this old building is the marina run by North Highland Charters. Cabin cruisers can be hired by the week, and motor launches, dinghies, etc. by the hour. There is also a snack bar during the summer months. 
Beside the marina is the Frank Searle Loch Ness Information Centre. Here the visitors can see pictures of the Loch Ness monsters, a fantastic display of information, newspaper and magazine cuttings from many parts of the world, and obtain some intelligent answers to their questions about the Loch Ness scene. There is no admission fee. The large building a few hundred yards along the loch is the Foyers Hydroelectric Power Station. Taking over four years to construct at a cost of more than £24 million, the station was opened on April the 4th, 1975, by Mr William Ross, then Secretary of State for Scotland. Heading back up the brae to Upper Foyers, one passes Foyers Bay House on the right. Here you get very good bed and breakfast for a reasonable charge. At Upper Foyers there is a small shop and a sub post office. And on the opposite side of the road a path leads down to the beautiful waterfall. For the next 15 miles the road goes away from Loch Ness, but the traveller is compensated by the beautiful scenery. The Whitebridge Hotel has a good bar, provides accommodation and serves bar snacks. Some three miles from Fort Augustus, the road reaches the highest point of Glen Doe, 1,275 feet above sea level. And from here one gets a wonderful view of the village and the Benedictine Abbey. The Abbey is on the site of the old fort erected by General Wade somewhere around 1726. In the 19th century, it was presented to the Benedictine Order by the then Lord Lovett, head of the Fraser clan. It now has a private school and is open to the public. There are several hotels and shops in Fort Augustus, and on the car park a tourist information centre. Here the road rejoins Loch Ness. Seven miles east of the fort it turns into Glen Morriston and the village of Invermorriston. The Glen is about 19 miles long and follows the course of the River Morriston from Loch Ness to Loch Clooney. There are several beautiful waterfalls and rocky gorges along the Glen. Near Torgal Bridge are the famous Glen Morriston footprints. According to legend, a preacher stood on this spot and to prove the truth of his preaching, vowed that no grass would ever grow where he was standing and strangely none has ever grown. Also in the Glen is the Roderick Mackenzie Cairn. This was erected on the spot where Roderick was killed by redcoats while trying to decoy them away from the cave where Bonnie Prince Charlie was hiding after his defeat at the Battle of Culloden. There is a good hotel at Invermorriston and a camping and caravan site. A few miles on is the Ortsai Youth Hostel, a popular stop for many young people. It was near here that I had my first Nessie sighting while on holiday in 1965. The road then runs under the shadow of Mill Favoni, at 2,283 feet, the highest point around Loch Ness. A translation of the Gaelic is the Round Hill of the Cold Moors. If the motorist stops by the John Cobb Memorial, he will be looking across the deepest part of the loch at 980 feet. This cairn was erected in memory of John Cobb after he was killed here in 1952 while attempting to break the world water speed record. Some writers have hinted at the possibility that a Nessie might have caused this tragedy and mentioned strange waves and wakes being seen just before the crash. But there is no evidence to support this idea. It seems most likely that the boat exceeded its maximum performance and exploded. Almost all visitors stop at the ruins of Urquhart Castle. This old fortress dates back to the 13th century and is believed to stand on the site of an earlier stronghold. It now comes under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of the Environment and is open to the public. The Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau led people to believe that Urquhart Castle was the best place from which to see a Nessie. This is sheer fiction. There is no one best place for sightings, it's all luck. 
just a matter of being in the right place at the right time. A short distance from the castle is Borlam Farm, which has a caravan and camping site and does pony trekking. In the village of Drumna Drocket, there are two hotels, a snack bar and a food store. The Gaelic name for this village is Drumna Drocade, which means the ridge of the bridge. Out of Glen Urquhart, the road runs very close to the lockside again, but because of the steep banks, there is little access to the water's edge. There are, however, a number of very good laybys along the A82 from which enthusiasts can do their Nessie watching. The Clansman Hotel, with its marvellous view of the lock, is a very popular place, and several good sightings have been made from here. A few miles on, and we come to the village of Lock End. And as its name implies, this is the end of Loch Ness. After that, it is just a short run back to Inverness, the only other possible points of interest being the caravan site at Dock Garrock and the excellent golf course near the Caledonian Canal. Like many other parts of Scotland, the Loch Ness area has some nice little stories, some folklore and others true. My famous tent site was situated beside a picturesque little stream known as the Witch's Burn. How it came to get its name makes a fascinating tale, and a true one. Back in the 1720s, a woman came from another part of Scotland and set up home in a little stone cottage on the banks of this burn. Her only companion was a large white duck, which followed her about much as a dog follows its master. In those far-off days, a woman living on her own and being followed around by a white duck just had to be a witch. The local history book says that the people of Dawes Village were sorely afraid of the lady. Some years later, there was a wedding at the tiny church in Dawes. A local girl was to be married to a Scottish soldier. And just as the happy couple were leaving the church, who should appear but the old witch carrying a large iron pot and followed by the white duck. She sprinkled the young people with some evil-smelling concoction from the pot and muttered something in a strange tongue, then went back to her cottage, followed by the white duck. There was consternation in the village. Everyone was convinced that some horrible disaster would befall the newlyweds. But apparently nothing happened. Some ten years later the old lady died and the villagers went to the cottage and burned all her possessions, thinking that that might dispel any evil. The story doesn't say what happened to the duck. The whole episode seems to have been forgotten then, until more than two hundred years later. Most of the land in this area belongs to the Alderi's estate, and the old laird died, leaving only two daughters. Now, despite Acts of Parliament and the screaming of women's livers, the laird has to be a man. And the next male in line was a cousin of the two daughters, an officer in a Scottish regiment. And suddenly he found himself inheriting a huge estate complete with castle, deer shooting and salmon fishing. And this lucky gentleman was a direct descendant of the young couple who were married indoors and were cursed, or so the people thought, by the old witch and her white duck. So the only conclusion to be drawn is that the much maligned old lady was a good witch. Another story about this area also goes back to the mid-1700s. It's said that after the Battle of Culloden, when the Hanoverian soldiers were hunting the defeated Jacobites, two badly wounded Highlanders were hiding under the Witch's Bridge. The then owner of Balacladdock found them and at much risk to himself took them into the croft and tended their wounds. But in vain, both soldiers died the following night. The crofter buried them in the steep bank at the end of the large field to the east of Balacladdock. As he dare not mark the grave for fear of the redcoats finding it, he planted an ash tree over the bodies. Then, a year or so later, when the Hanoverian troops had left the area, a large stone was placed in the bank with the date 1747 carved into it. 
In 1970, Mr Bill Fraser of Bewley, who was brought up in Dawes Village, told me that as recently as 1931 the stone could be seen. But since then the bank has caved in and buried it, or at least that seems to have been the case, because I can find no record of anyone having taken it away. It seems a pity that the present tenant of Balacladic didn't preserve the stone. It would certainly be of great interest to the many visitors who use his camping field. Anyway, the story has it that the ghosts of these two Jacobites walk the road between Balacladic and Doors. And now to conclude. We have established that there is no pattern of Nessie sightings. It's all pure chance. Anyone visiting Loch Ness could be lucky. You could sit on the bank for ten minutes and get a sighting, as some people have done. Or you could stay for ten years and see nothing. So the Nessie hunter must always have a camera ready for use, preferably with a telephoto lens. Have the cover off, lens set on infinity, and check the light every few minutes. Most sightings are of less than ten seconds duration, so you must use a camera rather in the same way as you'd use a gun. It is much better to watch the lock from near water level rather than from an elevated position. That way you are more likely to get background in your pictures. My main camera is a 16mm Canon Scoopic automatic movie camera with an 8x zoom lens. This is backed up by a 35mm SLR fitted with a 500mm telephoto lens. When my assistant is with me, she carries another 35mm SLR with a 135mm lens. Because of the bad light conditions so often encountered on Loch Ness, it is often more practical to use very fast black and white rather than colour film. And remember, always be on the alert. You may not get a second chance. My aim at present is to obtain a piece of coloured movie film from very close range, which, if not good enough in itself to identify the Loch Ness animals, might just spark off some serious scientific research. These days I don't spend quite so much time out on the Loch as I did in the early days, because I now run the small information centre, which entertains something like 25,000 visitors a year. I also answer around 2,000 letters each year. But with the help of a volunteer girl Friday, who looks after the public relations while I'm out Nessie hunting, I have now clocked up more than 38,000 hours of camera watching, and made 31 sightings. But mainly because of the brevity of the sightings, I have only managed to take pictures on nine occasions. The best of these are on display at my centre. And now, having listened to this recording, I am sure you realise that there is much, much more to the Loch Ness story than the sketchy reports given out by the media. One day, perhaps you will be able to visit Loch Ness. I do hope so, because really that is the only way to find out the true story of the Loch Ness Monsters. Goodbye.